Welcome everybody to our TIFF Talk Tuesday. Thank you for tuning in today. I'm very excited. Uh, we have our special guest today, Dr. Jim Sattler. Uh, Dr. Sattler is a gastroenterologist specialist in Torrance, California. His major areas of interest are therapeutic biliary and therapeutic endoscopy. Uh, he's been practicing medicine in the South Bay for over 20 years. Thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Sattler. My pleasure. Excited to be here. Thank you. So as you all know, you're joining today. Um, our TIFF Talks are really intended for you guys, our viewers, uh, to ask questions, uh, learn a little bit more about GERD and the TIFF procedure. So please do not hesitate to ask any questions that you may have by uh, typing them into the little chat box um, to the right of the live video and we will do our best to answer all of your questions today. So uh, my name is Andrea Millers and I'm with Endogastric Solutions. And again, welcome to our TIFF talk. But Dr. Sattler, let's go ahead and start. Um, maybe we can start um, with maybe describing a little bit more what GERD is. GERD is the typical kind of symptom that all of us have from time to time with they can generally manifest as heartburn, but it can also masquerade as abdominal pain, throat pain, asthma, hoarse voice. It comes in many different sizes and flavors. <laughs> flavors, so, I like that. <laughs> it's not one size fits all. That's a good point. So there's a lot of, um, there's kind of what those typical symptoms and then atypical symptoms um, that we always hear about, um, like the heartburn. Um, but the ones that probably are more, uh, we hear about a lot are the atypical symptoms um, similar to, um, oh gosh, coughing or uh, difficult um, difficulty swallowing. Um, can you talk a little bit more about other symptoms that someone could potentially feel um, from suffering from GERD? I would say the most common symptom that I see when for someone that doesn't have the typical symptoms would be a sore throat. The sensation that there's something stuck in your throat, even though you know there isn't anything there, that tends to make people feel like they need to always clear their throat or always swallow and it tends to be really bothersome for patients. Yeah, that's a good And thing. the burning in the throat and the throat pain. Sometimes people more rarely have um, what otherwise you might think are allergies, but a lot of nasal problems, chronic sinus problems. Okay. Um, occasionally asthma. Okay, right. Cough, shortness of breath. Yeah. Yeah. So today I thought we'd do a little bit, um, every time I ask you a question, um, a little fact or fiction, if you will, just for something different or true or false. Um, so we get a lot of questions or, and people talking in these GERD um, groups. And um, I thought we'd do this fact or fiction. So the first one is GERD can cause repeated coughing episodes during sleep, leaving sufferers gasping for air. Fact or fiction? Totally correct. Okay. <laughs> totally correct. And I think that symptom when you're younger is not um, usually dangerous, but for people that are much older that are continually waking up in the middle of the night coughing and gasping for breath, the reason why that's happening is because they swallowed some of their gastric secretions into their lung. And as you get older, to clear that from your lungs goes down and that's a, a risk for pneumonia. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, one more uh, before we move on to the next topic. Uh, GERD can cause dental cavities, true or false? GERD definitely can and it can also uh, thin the enamel in people's teeth I'll be honest, the problem is it's very hard to prove exactly what the cause is. Okay. So it's, I, I think it's hard to say, you know, and I've asked many dentists about this yeah. because patients come in and they say, my dentist said, I don't have any enamel or I'm getting too many cavities. Unfortunately, there's no specific test that can confirm that, you know, without question. And so, yes, 
it may be a reason to do a procedure. Okay. It's hard to bet on exactly what the result is going to be. It's too bad we don't have a better test. Yeah, let's talk about that that a little bit um, tests because um, obviously someone just doesn't come in and say, oh, I have GERD or reflux, and then all of a sudden they're going to have the TIF procedure. There's quite a few diagnostic diagnostic tests that they need to do. Can you talk a little bit about that, um, the process? Sure. I think that, you know, the most important thing you said is what is the patient's history? What are their medical problems? Does their, do their symptoms sound like reflux? And then it comes down to proving that their symptoms, to what degree their symptoms truly are due to reflux. And so, you know, what we do is an endoscopy, which is passing a scope down through the mouth to look at the esophagus and see if there's evidence of um, ulceration or inflammation in the esophagus from acid reflux. And that's a very good indicator. If we see that, we can be pretty convinced that there's acid reflux going on. Um, we also want to look at the anatomy of the esophagus to determine whether there's a hiatal hernia, which is where if we, your chest is up and your belly is down, the food pipe should cross right at the diaphragm. The stomach is right below. So we can see endoscopically if the stomach has moved up into the chest. That is a hiatal hernia. It's very common. We need to know whether there is one. How big is it? Okay. And then we want to make sure that there's nothing else going on in the esophagus. And we want to look at the stomach and make sure that this, there's no bacteria in the stomach, ulcers, etc. And after that, if uh, the patient wants to proceed with a TIF or some type of anti-reflux procedure, all of these procedures uh, tighten the muscle between the bottom of the esophagus and the stomach. So if you're tightening the outflow of the esophagus, you need to make sure that the esophageal muscle contractions are strong enough to push the food through the esophagus into the stomach. So on every patient, we do what's called esophageal manometry, okay. which is where we pass a tiny tube through the nose into the esophagus. We can have the patient swallow sips of water. And we can very accurately determine how strong the muscle contractions are. Okay. And the uh, last test that we generally always do, the manometry is a must, the endoscopy is a must. Okay. Depending upon the symptoms, the majority of time we want to try and get an objective measurement of how much acid is actually refluxing into the food pipe. Mm -hmm. And at the time of endoscopy, we can attach a little clip to the esophagus that will measure acid in the esophagus for 96 hours. Patient wears a little beeper, there are no wires like a beeper, the patient can input their symptoms so that we can correlate their symptoms with the time of day, whether they ate recently, whether they're sleeping, and what the acid exposure is. Uh, no wires and the clip falls off and that gives us a tremendous amount of information. Wonderful. And then based on that information, we would know whether it's reasonable to do a procedure and if so, exactly what. Perfect. Thank you. for That was a really good explanation of all of those diagnostic tests, so thank you. Um, we already have some questions coming through, so I'm going to ask a couple of questions um, that we're getting. Uh, we have Allison. She's asking, should I get an endoscopy before the TIF procedure? Well, there you go. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, we I, have not I say also, if I may. Yes, please. If someone is interested in a TIF procedure, they should get an endoscopy done by someone who does the TIF procedure, because we are looking for specific anatomic findings that um, a endoscopist who doesn't do the TIF procedure isn't used to looking. At. And we look at it very, very carefully. So I will not, I always repeat the endoscopy if I have not done it myself. Oh, that's And good. that's the reason, because oh. it's critical. Wonderful. Thank you for that point. Yes. Uh, so we've got another uh, question. Um, how much pH do you need for 
quality TIF uh, to qualify for the TIF procedure? I think that what I've learned over the years, I've been doing the procedure since 2011. And before that, I was very interested in all the procedures that preceded this. The TIF, the TIF by far and away is absolutely the best. And I think that you have to put everything together and you can't, you know, it's hard to pin the tail of the donkey with one test or one symptom. So, um, you know, in general, the more acid exposure there is, the more abnormal the pH is, the better the chance is that the patient is going to have a good response to anti-reflux surgery. So the worse, the better. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about uh, managing GERD symptoms, um, even before talking about um, procedures. Are there different foods or lifestyle modifications um, that patients who are suffering from GERD can do to help with their GERD symptoms? There are, you know, a few sort of key lifestyle um, issues, uh, which for some people are easy to do and for other people it's not, but uh, eating smaller, more frequent meals so that there's less distension in the stomach, less to come up. Uh, for some people, the type of foods is very important. For others, it actually isn't. So to tell a person that they shouldn't drink coffee if coffee doesn't make their acid reflux worse, uh, that's not an issue. If having tomatoes makes your acid reflux worse or citrus fruits, don't eat them. But if they don't bother you, I think it's okay. For sure, alcohol tends to um, loosen the muscle between the stomach and the esophagus and can promote reflux. Also, uh, tobacco okay. uh, also can do that. And Eating on a, right before you go to bed at night leaves a lot of food in the stomach that is then going to come up. And I would say the last thing is that uh, your weight has a significant, mm -hmm. is a significant factor. Because if you have a extra weight you're carrying, that's more pressure on your stomach that then is going to push food up. Good points. Yes. Uh, let's do one factor fiction. Uh, Peppermint soothes pain associated with reflux. Back factor fiction. That is fiction. Uh, peppermint tends to, again, lower the pressure of the lower esophageal muscle and can lead to increased reflux. Okay. Peppermint is good for other GI problems, people that have a lot of gas or bloating. Peppermint can be quite helpful, but may not be for reflux. Okay, thank you. All right, what options are available available to treat GERD? So um, I know obviously maybe you can elaborate a little bit about PPIs, um, talk about the different procedures like the Nissen fund application and obviously TIF or any other procedures you'd like to discuss. Sure. Well, well, the first thing I'd like to say is I have no financial interest in endogastric solutions. <laughs> and I have been interested in doing endoscopic treatment for reflux going back to the year 2000 or before. I'm very excited about the TIF procedure because I think it's an excellent procedure that's safe, doesn't cause problems. Other procedures may cause problems. And so I'm excited about it. And because I've helped a lot of patients. Uh, I think that in terms of medical treatment, there are acid-reducing medicines, the H2 blockers. Uh, Zantac and ranitidine were, was the most common one. There's a problem with ranitidine that is very unusual, um, and that's been taken off the market, but there are other H2 blockers like Depsid or Famotidine. Stronger blockers are the proton pump inhibitors, um, of which there are many. None is better than you know, it's not that there's one that's better than another. It's uh, what works the best for you and is the least expensive. And then when it comes to anti-reflux procedures, in the past, um, the typical procedures have all been surgical, where the surgeon would wrap the lower part of the stomach, or the upper part of the stomach around the lower part of the esophagus to increase the pressure differential and increase the function of the valve. And the typical is a, a 
laparoscopic Nissen fundoplication. That is sort of the gold standard. And that's where the stomach is completely wrapped around the esophagus. It does treat reflux. The problem is there are a lot of side effects that people frequently have. And it can be one from not being able to swallow or difficulty swallowing. The other major problem is um, one of bloating, and a lot of people with reflux have bloating already. So you may potentially have more bloating, not, not uncommonly. Not being able to vomit, not being able to belch. So if you like beer or carbonated beverages, that may come off the menu because you'll be uncomfortable. Right. And there are other surgical procedures where the wrap is not uh, completely around the stomach. And those side effects which occur with Nissen are, are a little bit less frequent. But as a gastroenterologist, I you know, have been practicing geez, since 1984. Gastroenterologists were taught, we were taught, never ever send a patient to surgery. Because people, well, we end up seeing that they didn't do well with the Nissen. And that's been drummed into many, many gastroenterologists, including myself. And that's why I'm excited about the TIF, because by and large, when you look at studies carefully, the TIF is just almost as good, very, very close. And in other studies, better than a Nissen in terms of treating the symptoms of reflux, but you don't cause any problems. And so in our experience since 19, uh, I mean, since 2011, we've done, I think, 93 or 94 patients. Right. We keep track of everybody. We've published our results. And fortunately, knock on wood, we've not had one complication. That's fantastic. And, and there's not been one patient that developed a symptom as a result of having the TIF that they didn't have before. So we don't have any gas bloat. We don't have any trouble swallowing when we've been fortunate. We're very careful in how we select our patients. Wonderful, excellent. So we're gonna answer a couple more questions that have come through. Um, Allison's asking, or she's saying, I take two pills a day and still get the bitter taste in my mouth. Is that normal? No. Not normal, and um, you know the crux of the matter is is the bitter taste in your mouth actually gastric secretions, mm -hmm. and you know if it is and you're taking two pills a day, um, and you're uncomfortable, then that's the type of patient that I would consider uh, doing a procedure on. Now I, I think that the the sweet spot for TIF is. There are some symptoms that people have where you're 100% or 95% sure that their symptoms are due to reflux. No one could say and sign on a dotted line, yes, what was this patient's name or this person's name who asked the question? Oh, it was Allison. Okay, Allison. No <laughs> one could guarantee, despite all of our tests, that your acid, your bitter taste in your mouth is from gastric reflux. But if it's bothering you and we have enough objective data, i.e., what does your endoscopy look like? What does your pH study look like? Then we can come up with a pretty good idea of is that likely? And if it's likely and you understand that I can't guarantee that that bitter taste is going to go away, then we would proceed. The beauty of the TIF is when you're not 100% sure, I can tell Allison that I'm not going to make you any worse. You're not going to end up with bloating. You're not going to end up with trouble swallowing. You're not going to end up with inability to belch. And the issues with the surgical procedure is that is not the case. So you could make a patient worse than they were before you started because now not only do you have a bitter taste in your mouth, but you can't belch, you can't have a beer, et cetera, et cetera. All right. That's a very good point. Uh, so, Joe, we have another question from Joe and Sally. Uh, they're asking, where are you located? <laughs> Hawaii. No. Hawaii. No. I wish I was there. <laughs> Me too. I wish I was there too. 
<laughs> Actually, the Caribbean would be better. Okay, no, I'm in um, Torrance, California, just a little south of LA, like 20 miles. Okay, south. and how, how could they look you up if they're trying to find you, Dr. Sattler? Uh, Facebook, um, our website, uh, which I think we have available, correct? Yep. Yes, it's on uh, the screen right now. Yes, so the so, website is on absolutely. there. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. So that we do get a lot of questions about long-term side effects of PPIs. And as a GI, um, you could probably talk uh, um, in, in depth about this. Um, as you had mentioned, you've been you know, practicing for a very long time and um, probably have prescribed you know, PPIs. Um, and most people that have GERD are probably on PPIs. Um, is is it is it something they need to be concerned about the long term side effects of PPIs? I think in the overwhelming majority of cases, PPIs are extremely safe, and there have been a lot. There's been a lot of research done, but it is research that shows an association between things and not cause and effect. So there are, you know, the, the concerns that got all of our attention, especially mine, because I take a PPI here and there, dementia, you know, oh my God, you right. know, and stop taking it. No, dementia is not an issue. Are you going to get a heart attack from it? No. Can, is it going to affect Plavix or Clopidogrel if you're on that for coronary artery disease? No. Is it going to have make you uh, susceptible to a bone fracture. That, we're pretty comfortable that that is not the case. Okay. Um, we do need to be careful in certain circumstances about magnesium levels, which we can easily check. And there are, is a very uncommon occurrence with kidney function. That is also extremely difficult to pin down. It can occur with any drug. And I think all of us, patients and doctors, are well attuned to that. So we keep an eye on someone's kidney function. And it's, um, I would say, the only uh, reason or clear-cut issue that you would want to stop a PPI would be if, if you were one of those occasional people that had kidney issues with it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I uh, appreciate that. I know we get lots of questions about um, PPI usage. Um, so can you talk a little bit more about the TIF procedure. How does it work? Um, you did explain it a little bit, um, but maybe um, explain to the viewers um, what's the mechani mechanism of action? How does it actually function and work? So the procedure, you know, literally takes the upper part of the stomach and wraps it around the esophagus so that it creates a much longer and tighter uh, valve so that it takes much more pressure in the stomach to make anything go back up into the esophagus. And so we do that all endoscopically. It, the um, device allows us to place uh, plastic sutures so that we can actually staple the stomach. It's, it's not a metallic staple, they're plastic. Well, we actually put in anywhere from 20 to 40 of these fasteners, which secures the wrap. Mm -hmm. And over a period of several weeks, scar tissue forms around there to solidify it. And um, that dramatically decreases any reflux from the stomach into the esophagus. Um, let's talk a little bit. Um, actually, let's answer some questions. We got a couple more questions here. Um, hi, if a patient has a small hiatal hernia, can they get the TIF procedure? <laughs> yes. That is the reason why um, you want to have your, if you're serious about a TIF procedure, that you have your endoscopy done by a physician who does the TIF procedure. So we can take a look and tell you whether you can have what we call a straight TIF procedure to fix your reflux problem. If there is a significant hiatal hernia where the stomach is slipped up, we partner, um, we've partnered with a great uh, surgeon in our practice. His name is Clark Fuller. He's a gastroenterologist dream. 
because he is a trained as a cardiothoracic surgeon. So he's very comfortable working in the chest area, but he's also trained as a gastric and esophageal surgeon. Okay. So if uh, when we have patients that have hiatal hernias, what we do is Dr. Fuller laparoscopically with little holes in the stomach, he brings down the stomach back into the chest. And immediately after he's done, we perform the wrapping procedure. Now, you may ask, um, why doesn't Dr. Fuller just go ahead and wrap the stomach himself? You know, he's already there. That is a nissen. And um, that is what we're trying to avoid. There are patients, I'm not gonna say that a TIF is, you know, the only reasonable procedure for every patient. There certainly are patients where, you know, I'd have Dr. Fuller do a Nissen or a variation thereof, but um, I would prefer to do a TIF with Dr. Fuller's help rather than him doing a straight Nissen. And he's very comfortable doing that. Fantastic. Uh, so let's go ahead and talk a little bit about recovery. Um, what's the recovery from a TIF procedure? Is it a long hospital stay? Is it overnight? Um, maybe discuss a little bit about post-surgery, post um, diet, post-op diet. Um, what, can, what can a patient expect after they have the TIF procedure? We always um, have our patients uh, stay overnight. And uh, the reason is we don't want, first of all, we wanna make sure that if a patient is having pain that there's adequate uh, pain control. We also don't want people to have nausea or vomiting or excessive coughing. And so we have a very good uh, drug cocktail <laughs> and it works great. And if I had to have an operation, I'd wanna be spaced and sleeping for the first uh, 12 hours. And so that's what I make sure you do. And um, we, we have pain medication available, but the surprising thing is that most people have very little pain. And I can't remember the last time I needed to send a patient home on narcotics. Um, the pain control is usually with uh, Tylenol and um, Motrin or ibuprofen. Uh, we have not had problems with uh, nausea, though we do send people home with an anti-nausea medication. People will generally kind of have a vague chest discomfort. I mean, we have the pain gets referred to your chest. It feels a little quirky, a little achy, um, generally is gone within a few days to a week or so. You might have an occasional twinge here and there for a couple of weeks, but no one no one has been incapacitated at all by pain. Okay. Um, the uh, diet afterwards, uh, most people uh, are happy about it because they lose weight. <laughs> and, um, for most people, that's a good thing. But, you know, I don't have people complaining about the diet or they're, they're starving. What you need is a magic bullet. And because for the first few days you're on basically anything you can put in a bullet and grind it up that's what you can eat okay. and, hamburger uh, too <laughs> no not yet hamburger in about uh, maybe five to six weeks okay by week four you're eating dark meat turkey and by um i jotted a few notes here you know by the end of the first week you can eat something in the form of mashed potatoes and that sort of consistency okay. or a cauliflower puree or any vegetable puree that you want. Um, but the diet, when you look at it on a piece of paper, it looks horrible, but <laughs> people actually do extremely well with it. Yeah. So you don't get many complaints about it. Um, I, yeah. Seriously, one or two. I've heard uh, after the procedure, you're not as hungry either for some reason. So just the liquids satisfies people. <laughs> yes. And, you know, there are other, you know, protein shake. Yeah. You know, boost, ensure anything that you can blend up. Okay. So. 
Yeah. Uh, and then what about activity? We get lots of questions about activity. Um, and then also, I'd, if you could talk a little bit about if they do get the combined procedure with the hiatal hernia repair and the TIF procedure, does that change uh, their post-op recovery time and things that they can and can't do? Amazingly not. Okay. Amazingly not. And, you know, I'm in, I've been in the operating room. We've most, uh, I would say three quarters of the patients generally have a hiatal hernia that needs to be fixed. And you definitely want to be aggressive about fixing a hiatal hernia if it's there, because if you don't, the outcome is not as good. Okay. So if we're not 100% sure that you don't need it repaired, we get it repaired. But um, now I've been in the operating room in 60 cases, and it's amazing to me what is done, and it doesn't bother people. And there, I've never asked had a patient. I mean, had someone ask me that question, but I don't think there's any difference in the recovery, pain, et cetera, et cetera, between doing a straight TIF or having it done laparoscopic. Wow, that's great. That's good to hear. Um, and you've, you've done quite a few procedures too, so you should know, right? Um, you need to be careful about physical activity though. Okay, oh yeah. That, that's important. Um, if you do things that increase the pressure in your belly, the best way to explain that is, it's a little graphic, but if you are straining to have a bowel movement, so you've closed your lips and you're bearing down, that generates a tremendous amount of intra-abdominal pressure, which can disrupt a surgical repair or a TIF repair. Okay. And so I think anytime a patient has an anti-reflux procedure, you need to change your behavior. Just as though if you tore your ACL and you don't change the behavior that you were doing that led to that tear, and you get it repaired, it's gonna tear again. Right. So you, we, I'm really stressed to patients to do what your mother told you. You lift with your knees and you're breathing in and out. If you're breathing, you cannot generate pressure. Right. And that's crucial in the first month or so. We don't want people lifting more than five pounds for the first couple of weeks and then 25 pounds after that. But even down the road, you can lift, but you need to do it properly. Okay, that's really good. Okay, we have a couple more questions um, or, or comments. I have frequent, uh, frequent chest pain and was told it's from digestion. I've, I've been to a heart specialist who found nothing. I also did a swallow test and no hernia, so not sure where to go from here. Can you help? <laughs> I think that um, what I would say is the further someone gets away from the typical reflux symptoms of heartburn, food coming up into your mouth, um, you know, the pain in the upper part of your stomach, those are the classic symptoms. And those are much more, you can make a much better and more reliable diagnosis that it's GERD on the typical symptoms. And that's one end of the spectrum. Okay. The other end of the spectrum is what this person is asking. And so it's difficult to prove, you know, beyond a doubt that it's due to acid reflux. And as I said, you do the endoscopy. If there's a lot of inflammation in your esophagus, then that's a good point that it is. If you do a pH study and there's a tremendous amount of acid reflux and you don't have gallstones and we've checked for that, the cardiologist has said it's not the heart and your esophagus contracts normally, so it's not muscle contraction, then that patient could do very well with a TIF. That's exactly the patient I would not do a Nissen on. Mm. Because if, you, if we're not right, even in our best attempts to be accurate, you're not gonna end up with gas blow. You're not gonna end up not being able to swallow or difficulty swallowing. Right. and still have your chest pain. Yeah. And that's the sweet spot for this procedure. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, so one other question, how hard is it for someone who is very thin? 
the thinner the better. <laughs> <laughs> because if you are overweight, the pressure of the weight on the belly mm. is um, very significant. And so if your weight, now we use what's called the BMI, which is body mass index. And if your body mass index is over, so that takes into account your height and your weight. Mm -hmm. It's not a perfect scale because we know that you can be 5'10 and have a lean body build and be 5'10 and have a stocky body build. Right. Unfortunately, this formula does not take that into account. But if your BMI, and you can look it up online, you can easily figure out your BMI. If your BMI is um, over 32, definitely over 34-ish, you are not a candidate, certainly if it's 34 or 35 for a TIF. And if your BMI is 40, then you probably, then doing an anti-reflux operation is not the right operation and you need a operation to a weight loss operation and between 35 and 40 is a gray zone between a weight loss operation i.e a gastric sleeve or a gastric bypass as opposed to a surgical anti-reflux procedure yeah good point Okay, well, we're getting close to the end. Can you talk a little bit about it? Is quick. Let's stay up a little longer. Ah, sure. <laughs> we do still have some more questions, but can you talk, talk a little bit about um, recovery? Or I mean, you did talk about post-op, but maybe you have a really um, interesting story about a patient that you had, or or any tips um, for patients that are potential patients, if you will, that are watching. Um, what it's like to live GERD free um, after the TIF procedure. I think the 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 most interesting and gratifying patient that I had, um, still have, and this was done. I took care of this patient probably six seven years ago. He was eighteen at the time. Wow. He was not overweight at all. Totally healthy, thin guy. And he had this horrible throat pain and he'd been to tons of ENT doctors and the ENT folks will say it looks like acid reflux. There's no specific ENT finding, but basically the throat is red when they look and there isn't any other obvious explanation. So we put him on PPIs for a long time. He never got better. He was miserable oh, wow. and miserable. And not only that, he was a singer. Oh. And he couldn't sing because it was hurting his throat. Wow. So again, this is the gray area of people. We did his acid study. He had no hiatal hernia. We did his acid study, and it was markedly positive. Mm -hmm. So we did the TIF. He then went away to school shortly thereafter. He went to uh, Tulane. Okay. And he became a music major. His symptoms, this is totally honest is he became a music major and was in the choir and then became a voice instructor. Wow. He's back here in the South Bay. He's not, a, he's not on any medicines. Okay. And, you know, he's 23 or four now. I thought and, you were to tell us it was some famous singer or something. Yeah, <laughs> but, but still, that is a oh. great story. That's no, actually that was really, that was, that yeah. was probably, because, you know, we took a chance. Yeah. Couldn't guarantee it. The patient totally understood. His dad is my patient, too. Oh, wow. And, and, yeah, his dad is my patient. And he was miserable with typical reflex symptoms. Miserable. And then he was afraid to have anything done. Wow. And so his son kept telling him. And his dad's a, his dad's a lawyer. <laughs> uh oh <No. laughs> And he's a real athletic guy. And... He was on double dose PPIs and he couldn't have a cup of coffee. He couldn't eat a piece of pizza. He had a big hiatal hernia. And his son kept saying, Dad, get this done, you know? So four years later, wow. we had Dr. Fuller fix the hernia. We did our thing and he was off his meds and doing, doing well. So the recovery, I think that you need to take into consideration how physical 
physically demanding your occupation is. Mm -hmm. But, and, and that has an effect on the recovery, right? right. Um, but if you're um, more sedentary, people are going back to work in a week or so. Yeah. And I think that to, depending upon how physically demanding your job is, that is a much more of a personal situation. I did have a patient who had horrible throat pain. This is another guy I remember. And he was actually a trash collector. Oh, wow. And he did not respond to anything. But his pH study was off the chart. And we kept him off. I explained to him how to lift properly. Mm. And he went back to work, I think, in about six, six weeks or so because, you know, we needed to be careful. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to undo what you just did. <laughs> um, we had another question come up. Um, is a four centimeter hiatal hernia considered a, con a concern or very large or large? It, it's a moderate, I would say it's a moderate size hiatal hernia, but it depends upon what your symptoms are. Yeah. And um, I'm not having much in the way of symptoms. Do I know I don't have a hiatal hernia? No. You know, everybody that has a hiatal hernia doesn't necessarily have symptoms. Right. So, you know, it depends upon the individual. Right. Perfect. Uh, and I, that's about all the questions we have tonight. Um, one thing I did, you, you had mentioned that I thought is interesting is the gentleman that the father that ended up waiting four years. Um, the, the question is always, when do I, when do I finally, when am I finally fed up with feeling the way I feel and when is it the right time to go in? And you did, you mentioned that, that a little bit about, you know, knowing your timing and recovery, everybody's different. Um, but uh, I think it's best, and you can probably recommend that if they're suffering and they're having pain and chest pain or throat problems, they need to come and see a, a GI or a, a physician. I, I think that those people, people that have those kinds of symptoms, and we didn't talk about it, we should mention it really quick, Sure. is that there is a link between heartburn and esophageal cancer. We did not talk about that. Thank and you. that yes. is very, very important. And so if people are having these kinds of symptoms and they're ongoing and persistent, you really need to have an endoscopy done to make sure that you don't have what's called a Barrett's esophagus. That's where stomach cells have crawled up into the esophagus. This is the only link between esophageal cancer and acid reflux. If there's a Barrett's change in the esophagus, it's very small but there is an increased risk of esophageal cancer. And so, you know, you need to be screened, just like we do colonoscopies. Right. You don't need to be screened unless you have reflux symptoms. The other issue that's really important is that the severity of your reflux symptoms have nothing to do with whether you have a Barrett's lining or not. Mm -hmm. And the scariest patient that I see, and the Barrett's changes are more common in Caucasian, men, overweight men, patients with metabolic syndrome, unfortunately diabetes, obesity, hypertension, can happen to anyone, but that's the high risk group. And um, my, you know, um, fear level escalates rapidly when I see a 70 year old Caucasian male comes in the office and goes, I'm having trouble swallowing. Mm -hmm. And I say, okay, do you have heart acid reflux? No. Do you have heartburn? No. Mm. Do you take Tums? Oh, I've been taking Tums for years. Mm. And you go down, you do the endoscopy, and they've got a cancer. So if you're taking Tums on a regular basis or you're popping my Lanta on a regular basis, that's GERD. You need to be checked. Yeah, very, very good point. Uh, and, and one of the recommendations is be your own advocate, right? If you're a Absolutely. patient that's suffering, you, you don't need to go in. There, there's so many resources out there. so many physicians you could speak to, um, and, and find out what's going on. So don't um, suffer. Don't them. suffer. And the other issue is too, if you're going in for a screening colonoscopy, every patient who I see for screening colonoscopy, I also ask them about their reflux, if they have it, how much, what are you taking for it, 
And then we may combine an endoscopy at the time of colonoscopy and you're done. And you're done. Yeah. One time. Well, wonderful. Again, uh, Dr. Sattler, I can't thank you enough for joining us tonight. Um, you've given us some really good insight. Um, and I know that the people that have asked questions um, appreciate all of your answers. Um, again, do you want to remind everyone where you're located, how they can find you, your website, um, and your address and location, just in case your people sure. in the um, area? Sure. And um, our practice is uh, actually digestive care consultants, and I'm sort of one of the the last guy standing with my partner, Ken Holt. <laughs> and, but we have, we have 10 gastroenterologists in our group, but I'm the one who specializes in acid reflux. We're in Torrance, which is just, you know, Manhattan Beach is more well known than Torrance. So it's real close to Manhattan Beach and our website's digestivecareconsultants.net. Okay. And you, uh, my Facebook and Instagram, also and we can um, be happy to see you or help out perfect yes and your address and phone number is oh, on okay. the video too so they can contact you perfect. if they're in the area so right. if you're not in the area um, please feel free to visit girdhelp.com there's a lot of information about GERD and the TIF procedure in addition to that, if you're looking for a physician in your area and you're not in the Torrance area, you can um, put in your zip code or state and find a physician near you. In addition to that, uh, we have a YouTube channel where all of our TIFF talks that we have with our physicians are um, recorded and they're also on there. So if you ever miss any TIFF talk and you want to go back and learn more, you can watch them all on our YouTube channel. So. Dr. Sattler, thank you again for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And everybody, you stay safe and have a great evening. Thank you very much. Good night.